Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Chad Thackeray, a software developer specializing in automated trading systems and data science, who also runs an up and coming YouTube channel that focuses on analyzing cryptocurrency data such as on chain transactions and market prices. Chad has a particular interest in analyzing Monero because of its utility, and as you will see in this episode, given Monero's steady yearly growth and transaction count, Chad's analysis suggests Monero is highly undervalued and will likely have some big growth spurts in price in the years to come. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Chad. Thanks so much for coming on again, right? We, 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 tried again. This, uh, we tried this yesterday and I wanted uh, Chad to come on with his charts. Uh, we'll get into it. Um, yesterday, we were just going to like try doing a uh, talk about it, but I thought it'd be great to show the actual charts that he was working on so people can see it visually. And he was a gentleman enough to uh, put up with me and agree to uh, cancel yesterday and come on today. So thank you, man. Thanks for thanks for your patience. Appreciate that. No worries. I've got some meaty charts to show. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just showed me a little bit beforehand what we're going to be getting into. I think it's awesome. So you know, I'm I'm Monero Talk. I don't know if you've ever tuned in, but we we try to avoid talking about price. You know, we don't really make it a main topic of this show. Once in a while, obviously, it comes up. We usually talk about more of the nuts, nuts and bolts of Monero itself, um, but you know, as I always say, I think I think price is important, I, and I think as much as the Monero community tries to consciously avoid focusing in on price and rather focusing on you know metrics like uh, you know growth and transaction count, I think it's obviously important. Um, and it shows the the health of the network, the health of of adoption, right? It's just another, it's just another metric. Um, and I believe, you know, the the higher the price goes, um, you know, network effects then kick in. More people uh, see Monero, whether or not they come to then speculate on it or use it is is you know neither here nor there. But it gets more attention. The ecosystem grows. Uh, as the market cap grows, there, there's more money for you know people to to then donate to uh, devs. It's so it's it's obviously extremely important and critical. Um, I'm not one of these guys that thinks you know Monero works just as well at a dollar or ten thousand dollars. I never really understood that. Um, maybe that's my first question to you. What, what do you think about that when people say, you know, Monero works, it's just a tool uh, and it works just as well at a dollar or a thousand dollars? It is, I think, technically true in the, the literal sense that if you need to send a transaction to someone else, you know, somewhere in the world, you can do that at one dollar Monero. It's not a problem. But as we've seen with Bitcoin, it, like cryptocurrencies tend to be like what's called a, a vabling good, which is actually like as the price increases people actually want it more uh because they view it as less risky somehow mm -hmm. that tends that's what's happening with bitcoin anyway and it's assumed that monero if monero increases in price people generally want it more and so yeah i think as we'll see in a minute the price and the transactions taking place on the blockchain itself they're intrinsically linked somehow it gen generally as one increases the other increases now 
difficult to determine causality, whether it's the price going up that gets people interested and they get using it, or people use it, so they buy it, so the price goes up, difficult to unentangle. Um, but I think certainly as the price increases, you know, old school holders of Monero who are ideologically minded are going to become very rich and they're going to be able to fund research, as you said, and, you know, all these things end up working out. They can advertise, they can, you know, sponsor things. Very. Yeah. And I think, I think it also becomes more, yes, you can send Monero at a dollar or a thousand, whether it's a dollar or a thousand. Uh, but obviously I think it becomes more useful as a store of value as the price goes mm -hmm. up. Right. Uh, and then also for purpose, you know, liquidity, right? So now, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm limited in the amount of value I can send through the network if the market cap isn't high enough, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're, I don't know, if you're a billionaire and you want to send $10 billion through the Monero network, you can't do it at the minute. It's not, it's not going to happen. The entire right. market cap is $3 billion, so you can't do it. Right, which for me makes it, it's like, that's vitally important. I don't, I don't see, mm. you know... Monero hasn't really achieved success until somebody can theoretically, in my mind, you know, whether they're sending a dollar, ten dollars, or a billion dollars can essentially uh, do it with a click of a button. I think that's kind of the ultimate, the ultimate dream there. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So I, I came across you uh, through, you know, I, I go on YouTube every once in a while, and I, and I, I just search Monero to see if anybody's posting any Monero videos. Uh, kind of why I started the show myself because I just love consuming Monero content and I just love when I find new Monero content out there and so I came across your videos and they're great uh, mm -hmm. and you know you're not just Monero focused uh, you, you talk about Bitcoin and other coins and basically um, you you study the metrics right is that is that fair to say uh, you're, you're looking at like transaction counts you're looking at uh, on-chain data which with Bitcoin obviously makes more, a lot more sense than Monero. Um, and I thought, uh, I, I love what you're doing with Monero and how you're breaking it down. Um, so that's why I wanted to have you on and others in the community pointed you out as well. So thanks for doing this. And I guess first thing first, let's, uh, let's shill your channel a little bit, just let everybody know, because we're going to go through things now. Uh, but anybody who's watching and doesn't know about you yet, they definitely should be, be checking out your channel. So if you just want to let everybody know right now, and we'll repeat it again at the end. Yeah, so my channel is just it's just my name. It's just Chad Thackeray. Um, like Doug said, we just go through yeah more analytical, less sort of drawing random lines on a chart, more like pulling data from maybe even social media, but oftentimes you know um, blockchain data, and then you know I I tend to focus more on a technical crowd. Like I show people how to like make these charts themselves in Python. But if you just want to look at the pretty graphs, you can do that as well. Where did you get these skills from? Is this something? Is this uh, your trade? Is this what you studied in school? Uh, what, what? So my degree was in maths, actually. So just pure maths, which is, mm -hmm. I guess, why things like you know cryptography tends to appeal to me. Although I never studied much in my never studied much cryptography in my undergrad, and then after leaving university, you, you can't really make much money uh, with just maths. You know, just like pure strange alien languages that you do in pure maths. Um, and so I became a software developer and therefore, you know, just picked up Python and got stuck into these data science libraries. And to be honest, you learn as you teach other people. So that's, that's been the main source of my learning is the YouTube channel itself. Are you doing anything else in crypto? I mean, I, I, you're, you're studying it, you're analyzing it. Are you also developing? I'm not working directly on any protocols at the minute. Uh, as far as my like programming goes, uh, I mainly work in, with individuals to help them automate any trading strategies that they might have. So, you know, if you've got some idea for a crypto trading strategy, you want to trade X coin against X coin, you want to do arbitrage across exchanges. I do all the infrastructure and the backend stuff in Python. So that's what I spend my time doing at the minute. That's my job as it were. Very cool. Very cool. And so how did you find your way into crypto? How to find my way into crypto? Um, I basically discovered it back in like 2014 ish, just after the 2013 crash. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was a, a way to earn free money on the internet uh, if you could just mine it. So I just, you know, immediately pulled out my, uh, my gaming PC 
uh, tried to mine some Bitcoin and then quickly discovered uh, that I was going to earn something like two cents a day uh, if I left it running the whole time. Um, so I forgot about it for a bit. And then when I went to university, I just, the 2017 run sort of coincided with me entering university and I just got obsessed. Like I just, I just didn't really pay much attention to the university work uh, and spent most of my time learning about, about Bitcoin, about money, about all, you know, all these things just getting sucked further down the rabbit hole. Yeah, crypto has been a great way to ignore the uh, other parts of life, right? Like uh, yeah. school and the nine to five jobs, right? Uh, it's, it, it's a good distraction. Yeah, so it's, it's a fun hobby. Yeah. Um, and then when you talk to other people, they think you're kind of crazy. <laughs> Were a lot of your classmates getting into it too, seeing that they're, mm -hmm. you know, you're surrounded by math, you know, math people? It was actually pretty, I wouldn't say it was that, it was, wasn't that common really. Um, Maybe I just didn't meet enough of the math students. You know, math students tend to be uh, not the most sociable people in the world. Uh, you're not going to be, you know, no huge maths parties. Um, but no, it was it was it was a relatively niche thing. Even you know, even among math students, uh, among computer science uh, students at university. So maybe that's changed now after the after the 2017 bull run. But that's what I experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Monero people aren't the most sociable either. I, I would... <laughs> Especially well, with the... We're yeah. trying to change that with our Monero Topia event in, in Miami. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll get into that later because I want to I want to talk a little bit. But um, how did you find? So then, how did you move into Monero? Was Monero one of the coins you were looking at from day one, or was there a process there? Mm. So I guess back in yeah, 2017, Monero was. I think it was in the top 10 around that time. So that's that's how it just initially caught my attention just because it was, you know, the price was so high and it was just immediately there on CoinMarketCap when you have a look at it. Um, I sort of looked at it then, forgot about it. And then the thing that really got me sort of philosophically interested in Monero was the Daniel, Dr. Daniel Kim's talks. Mm -hmm. um, I found those like very refreshing. It was like... Um, you know, like a higher level view of why you should care about privacy, why you should care about Monero. Um, what flaws do does Bitcoin have? What trade-offs does Bitcoin make compared to Monero? Um, and so that that's basically how I, I got down the Monero rabbit hole. Um, and is uh, is it all the elements about Monero that kind of attracted to you to it, the entire system, or are you uh, you know interested in? The, the fungibility, privacy aspects, or is the scalability? You know, most, pe most people fo focus on, you know, the privacy. That's, you know, normally how Monero is framed, but it's also, I think, unique in terms of its, its on-chain scalability. What, what is it mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you're kind of most interested in there? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing that differentiates Monero, the thing that is pretty much number one on the list of priorities for the devs is the privacy fungibility aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the that's the main draw for me. Um, I am I'm actually somewhat skeptical about the the scalability, like the, the layer one scalability of Monero long term. That's something that kind of scares me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's it's sometimes worth it. You know, you want to make different engineering trade offs depending on what you want. And you know, if we struggle along a little bit with scalability to provide maximum privacy, I don't think that's too much of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I listened to your talk, your podcast with Arctic Mine. It's very mm. well worth listening to if you want to think about layer one scalability. Um, yeah, it, it's something I have questions about. I don't think it's something we can answer at the minute. I think we just have to see how it goes. Um, yeah, but mm -hmm. no, yeah. privacy is is the main the main draw for me. Yeah, yeah, that make that makes sense. I think a lot of a lot of people are focused, but yeah, Arctic Mine, uh, I think is is more interested in the scalability not to not to discount yeah. <laughs> out the privacy i'm sure you know i'm sure he obviously thinks it's important but uh i think that that's what really has attracted him to my understanding is what really mm -hmm. uh attracted him to monero in the early days um and then yeah the fungibility obviously intertwined with with privacy that's what you know essentially what gives monero its privacy the fact that it's i mean it's fungibility the fact that it's private by default uh so you know like you said, you know, you've been analyzing Monero. You analyze Bitcoin as well. Uh, you look at the on-chain on data of Bitcoin. What What do you think about that? Just that this fact that you know there you can analyze the Bitcoin blockchain. 
Uh, you can't even really do it in any any real way with Monero other than looking at transaction count. Um, what do you think of that? I mean, you think in terms of Bitcoin, obviously, you know, these the the concern of uh, the fungibility concerns, but just this fungibility aside, just this idea that you can basically surveil and look at transactions, whether you're doing it for purposes of uh, financial purposes and trying to understand where where the money's moving and and what's going on in the ecosystem. I mean, overall, do you think that's that's a that's a good thing to have, a bad thing, doesn't matter. I mean, what's your take on it in terms of it, you know, Bitcoin is this is this tool for finance that allows you to watch it in real time as as the money's flowing. Do you think that's something that we, you know, that that that's a positive, a negative or, you know. Yeah, I think there is like one positive I would say in that it provides ironclad auditability of the supply. Mm-hmm. Like you're absolutely 100% confident of the supply of Bitcoin. Like th- there's no there's no messing around. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter how how messed up the implementation is, there's never, if there is an implementation bug that causes some kind of inflation, you'll know about it within five minutes. Everyone will be screaming about it on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with, you know, an obscured chain like Monero, there is always that chance, you know, no matter how, how tiny, how many 0.001% is of happening. There's always that tiny little chance of something going wrong. So that is that is the the one advantage of the surveillability of the chain, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Although but, I, I've heard that spun yeah. into a negative, right? So like it, it because that can happen in Bitcoin, it would be more catastrophic, right? It's like uh, everybody would try to run out the door at the same time. Whereas Monero would be more of a slow leak of information. I guess the insiders, th- those most in the know and capable of understanding, would, would figure it out first. Uh, so it's not like the whole the whole ship would go down, which is an, an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I would say that's that's pretty much the one advantage I can think of. You know, of, of it being so surveillable and auditable. Mm-hmm. Um, you do pay with lots of downsides though um as there's a famous quote from thomas Sowell that i like there are there are no solutions only trade-offs uh and so one of the trade-offs for the auditability is obviously um you know if you're not careful when sending people transactions they know how much you know they know your entire bank account basically if you're using bitcoin as your main savings vehicle you know that can invite you know you can become a target for theft not you know really not great um yeah all sorts of problems with privacy um people can refuse to accept your transactions theoretically Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. if you're from a you know sending from a certain address although i'm not sure that's actually happened yet but it is i think it is a theoretical possibility um so yeah i think yeah bitcoin is at this point is optimized to be like um you know a reserve asset that you don't really touch it's kind of just you lock it away uh, and you just know that you will hold some finite percentage of the network. Right now, it's it's not working as digital cash, which mm-hmm. Monero is trying to be. Mm-hmm. And who knows with Lightning, maybe they'll do something amazing and that'll work. But yeah. How about from like a financial standpoint, right? So like mm. you're, you're looking at this data, right? Because you're trying to make predictions. Mm. Um, so, you know, in Bitcoin, there's more data to look at. And, and those that have the ability to, to look at it and analyze it, uh, you know, in, in, in a better way to have an advantage. Uh, so like, like Willie, are you familiar with Willie Wu? Right. Cause yeah. he kind of, I guess he's like the most known for that. Um, I don't know. I, are, are, are you think, are there concerns there too? I'm trying to like, is that, mm. cause we've never had that, right. We've never had, like, if, if we're all going to start using Bitcoin or Bitcoin and Monero and then, you know, it's there's going to be this ability to watch the flow of 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 value throughout the world, and you're kind of kind of be able to predict things and figure out things in ways you never have. Uh, do you think that's ultimately is that does that lead to a better outcome for society or or worse? Um, you know, uh, in that regard. Hmm. Yeah, I think that. That one, we're just gonna have to figure that out as we go along. I think that one's that one's up in the air. You know, we can we can theorize. You know, yeah. The the but, negative I, I see there is I just feel like it gives an unfair advantage maybe to those who are 
capable of understanding the data first you know it's mm -hmm. like it's because then they can use that to to their advantage whereas with monero uh nobody really has the ability to do it i don't know that's mm -hmm. right in terms of like if you want the most efficient way to to for society to be storing and transacting value um is a more efficient system one where there's no ability to 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 analyze it does that lead to like a, a more efficient way for for information to flow mm. in terms of uh value i don't know any, any any thoughts on that i know it's kind of an abstract question but yeah hmm. like my my guess would be that the um the you know the the clear chain the one that you, you know bitcoin would be sort of somehow better for that purpose but um i guess mainly due to like audibility like you have that 100 percent knowledge of the you know the fraction of the economy that you're accepting in that transaction mm -hmm. um and i guess the fact that you know people can figure out what's going on they can um you know you know that there's no whales controlling the whole network you know you know messing around um you know with the uh, the price or things like that um you you can't create like paper bitcoin as easily as you can with monero and things like that um but i i really don't know okay yeah no that's uh, yeah i see it i kind of see it as the well yeah, it, yeah. I, see, I see it as an extra friction the fact that you mm -hmm. can um you know view transactions that way it just it just adds friction to the system because now you have the ability to to look at transactions and because of that you know that that ties into the whole fungibility thing right so mm -hmm. it then uh, in effect becomes uh non-fungible uh and that's where fi friction comes in into the system because now when we're transacting uh, the transactions come with the history and then so it's it's not the 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 value won't flow as freely because things will be analyzed and you know the the one bitcoin i send you uh may not you know it wouldn't there there because you can't even look at the history in monero it's just it's just a whole sector that won't even exist and it won't uh, allow um you know that 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 friction to to be be there uh is, is the way i look at it yeah, I mean, uh, I can, yeah, I can see that. But uh, let's let's get into your charts. You want to okay. um, jump into this? Yeah, I'll share my screen. All right, I'm gonna throw it up there. How are we up? All right, yeah, it's up there. Okay. Um, so this first chart we've got here, this is the, so in blue is the average amount of transactions on a given day uh, on the Monero blockchain. So as you can see, you know, in 2017 period, we were lucky to get 5,000 transactions per day at the very peak. And whereas these days we're operating maybe an average of 25,000 a day. So that's a 5x growth in the network over the past three to four years, which not too shabby, really. And then in orange, we have the price of Monero. And as you can see, they do tend to move in tandem. Uh, we're on the linear scale here, so you can't really see the price action back here. Um, but certainly, if you look recently, you can see that the, the transactions per day and the price they tend to be very strongly correlated. You can see even the, the spikes tend to line up. Um, you know, when there's a spike in one, there's a spike in the other. When there's a dip in one, there's a dip in the other. And if we look at the log chart here, so all you do is you just take the you know the logarithm of both sides. It just sort of um, it pinches in a bit, so you can you can see what happened earlier on, and you can view things over different orders of magnitude. You can see here that the, the two curves are very much following in tandem. Now, is one causing the other? Uh, does As the price goes up, do more people use it? As the transactions goes up, does the price go up? Or is there another third factor you know, mm. affecting both of them? You, you can't really tell that from this graph, but it does seem to me at least that they are moving in tandem. 
does does is it can you tell if one's leading the other i, I guess obviously is, is what you're saying no you can't right you can't really see if one's leading i mean maybe there's some sort of statistical test that you can do um but you know it seems that sometimes one leads the other and then it sometimes you know so for example um back in 2017 here uh, the price led first and then the the volume lagged hmm. whereas now we you know the volume the transaction volume on chain is leading and the price is lagging in comparison so it, it hmm. tends to it just does what it wants basically but nonetheless they are moving in tandem now would bitcoin's chart look similar to this in terms of you know both of them kind of coinciding transactions per day and 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 price mm, well not really because of the like the the blocks are now full in bitcoin mm -hmm. so i think if you plotted bitcoin in the early days i think you you might get something like this mm -hmm. um these days what people tend to plot for bitcoin is the the value moved through the blockchain mm -hmm. so what's the you know what's the value of all the bitcoin moved in that block and then you know aggregate that over the day um i haven't actually done that myself but you can you can find charts of that online um mm -hmm. People do try to use that as a, a leading or lagging, you know, a leading indicator of what's happening on chain. Um, yeah, so if there's it's, more value going through the system, then you would think the, you know, the price was probably going to be going up because it means the system's being used more. Yeah, we can't do that in Monero, obviously, because I right. don't know how much each transaction was. Um, but at least um, the, the number of transactions is not limited in Monero the same way it is in Bitcoin. So we we basically get this graph whereas the bitcoiners will use the value moved mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's yeah that's basically the difference so looking at this what is it uh i mean in terms of predictions on where we may be be going um what are what are some things we could maybe maybe predict yeah so this graph i would say it's not it's not amazingly useful for predictions what it can do is you can look at it to determine like relative over under valuation basically so I, I would say there are two ways of looking at this chart um the first way is to say look we've gone up 5x in terms of our transaction volume why haven't we moved at least 5x in terms of price um if you count in things like metcalf's law like the you know the value of a network scales with the square of the number of nodes um you know, we could theoretically expect something like a, a 25x price increase given a 5x increase in the actual usage of the network. That would be that would be one argument. And so those people would say this proves that Monero is massively undervalued. Um, and therefore, you know, we need to see some sort of upwards correction. The other way to look at this chart is to say that we were actually massively overvalued in the 2017 period because of all the hype. And now we're returning to more of a, a parity, fair value. Um, that would be my bias. Um, and I think in the next few charts, we can have a look at some more uh, more detail as to why I'm on that train of thought. Um, yeah, but that that I would say that's its predictive power. It can tell you where we are relative to previous cycles. Monero's only been through one market cycle, so we don't have an amazing amount of data to work with. And then, is there anything we could gain from seeing when when they when they cross? You know, when there's so right now, uh, right? So so price is is under transaction yeah. count. Um, yeah. It looked like it tried to to pop out at one point, but came, you know, never quite came back over it again. Uh, yeah, is similar there, to back to, here and back to, would it be like like a breakout at that like is there would it potentially work mm. like that if it popped out over you know yeah. Monero broadly speaking if you, you can analyze the daily volatility of Monero mm -hmm. and you can it, Monero basically either does nothing in a day or it moves by some obscene amount it, it's much more it's got much wider tails on the volatility mm -hmm. um so you can see here, some days it just goes absolutely vertical when people start, um, you know, FOMOing in. And then you can also see it's basically been, you know, broadly flat for the past three or four years. So um, I think if we did see some sort of breakout, uh, it, 
you know, I'd, I'd get interested, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't, I don't use this too much for price prediction. I prefer my other charts for that. Okay. Hmm. So yeah, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll move on to the, um, the log regression chart. This is one of my favorites, mainly because it's, it's quite simple. Um, so you've just got a log chart of the Monero market cap. Uh, that's the blue line here. The reason I use the market cap is just because Monero is, uh, well, it is, it is a very new, at least compared to Bitcoin, you know, it's maybe half the age of Bitcoin. Um, and so at the beginning here, it was extremely inflationary. So, you know, the supply was doubling every couple of years. Um, and so if you were to just plot the unit price of Monero, I think that would be inaccurate. So I chose to plot the market cap here. Then what you can do is you can try and fit a function to the data. So some kind of mathematical function. There are lots of common ones that you can use. Now, you generally just look at the shape of the chart and you can figure out which function you want to use. In this case, it's a log function. So the equation would be if it's y equals a log x plus b, where a and b are some constants. And you run that through a computer, you get Python to work it out for you. And it'll work out this optimal line here that you see in the sort of light greenish color. And I fit that to what I call non-bubble data. So I don't think there's much value in trying to fit the line to you know the points up here mm -hmm. because it, we might not get one of these crazy rally, you know, these crazy mania phases anytime soon. Um, and so I prefer to be a bit more cautious and plot to data where things are just kind of chill, like, like they are right now. Like th there's not much hype and there's not much, um, you know, depression in the market. Things, things are kind of just relaxed to try and figure out some, some like real, like fundamental price for Monero or a price floor that we are unlikely to break and that using this error band that I've just plotted, the, the lighter green, we can try and think about opportunities for averaging in. That's how I think about this chart. Mm. So now now, now would be what type of time? Uh, we're just looking at this chart. Yeah. So anything within the green band, like personally, mm -hmm. I, would, I would consider that a time to buy. The mm -hmm. lower it gets down here towards the bottom end of this, you know, the more you want, uh, the more I would think about um, buying. So obviously during the COVID crash year, we went right down to the bottom and even slightly past it for a day or two. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're just sort of relaxing in the the upper end um, of this this band that we're in. I can plot some prices on there just to see like you know what what's our worst case scenario if we have a March twenty twenty type situation. Mm -hmm. According to like this regression, you get about $110 per Monero. So that would be like another, the world is ending event, you know, another liquidity event. I don't see Monero falling much below $110 ever again. Mm -hmm. That's that's what this is telling me at least. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've extended the graph out. And that's the way it might happen tomorrow, right? I mean, that's... Uh... Yeah, yeah. That, that's if, if tomorrow we had some catastrophic event um, like personally, I don't see Monero going below $110 for, I mean, it can do it for a few minutes while we get some liquidations on exchanges, but, um, over the course of a couple of weeks, I don't see it saying sustained below $110. Um, that's what the regression is telling me. It's never, it's never done that before in its history. Mm -hmm. And then you can extend the regression out as long as you like now. The longer you extend the regression past the data we have available, the more dubious it gets in terms of its predicting power. Mm -hmm. um, so I've extended it out to 2025. That's the you know the limit of what I would consider you know reasonable. Or that you can extend it out as long as you want, just for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and by then, you know we'd have a floor price of about three hundred and seventy dollars per Monero. Uh, that is that's the prediction according to this. And that would be, again, a, if we had a world-ending scenario on uh, January of 2025. So uh, s set your buy orders around 110 <laughs> right now, right? Yeah, one, 112 maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got you got to front run me, obviously. You can't. <laughs> um, awesome. I love this. 
Yeah. So we can do the same thing and we can look at like what's the upper end of the buying range. So again, for mm -hmm. if we if we're looking at this regression, um, you know, you can you can plot this out yourself and you can you know, depending on how cautious you are, you can adjust the width of these bands. So that's kind of a, a way of, you know, your own risk tolerance. Maybe if you're extremely risk averse, you only buy below this line. Um, and if you're a bit more, you know, if you if you don't mind losing short term, you buy above the line. Mm -hmm. So if we were at the top of the band, that would be a price of about 290. So I think we're about 200 these days. So mm -hmm. uh, we're about we're about halfway between the floor price and the sort of fair price ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, it's not yeah. The price can definitely go beyond it as it has in the past. Uh, but that would be when I would stop averaging in probably. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you extend it out to 2025, and you get the same sort of idea. It would be about $950. That would be the upper end of my dollar cost averaging. Okay. And then once again, so like, would you, if it were to pop out above, out of the green, you know, I guess over 290 today or something, obviously that's not happening today, but you know, would, would you then expect it to be like a, a breakout scenario where it would just, you know, like trend, trend up, uh, with, with no ceiling? Mm. Um, how, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, I try not to predict these things as in these things are inherently unpredictable. So it's why I try and I try and just think about when I'm going to buy Monero. Um, and that's why I have this band, but, um, you can look, so for example, well, we can look at the earliest one here back in 2017, as soon as it popped above the line, it used it as resistance here and then just went to the moon. Mm -hmm. And that's because we had that sustained increasing FOMO in the market. Um, a lot of the price of Monero is, is, is going to fundamentally depend on the emotions of the market. Um, at least the, you know, the short term ups and downs we had what looked like a similar sort of thing happening here uh, back, you know, from 2020 to maybe the early part of 2021. And then we had that surprise downturn in the rest of the market and that, that killed the momentum of that run. Mm -hmm. um, but if we do, if we see a repeat of 2017, you know, 2017 was two orders of magnitude above the lower line here. So, you know, hundred X. So theoretically, if, if we were to do that again, so say we wander around and there's some, you know, there's a there's a similar peak to what we saw in 2017, in 2025, you know, we're looking at 100x, uh, you know, times 370, which is 37,000 per Monero. Um, yeah, that that's only if we get into that feverish, you know, mode that we got in 2017. Um, but if we don't have that, you know, the the floor price is going to be somewhere around 370 which I, mm -hmm. I you know it's not it's not terrible mm -hmm. um yeah that, that's how i think about it i try and buy in this zone and then if we do enter a parabolic rally it's nice <laughs> do you think you know not to put you in a tough spot here but just you know makes it more entertaining do you do you think another parabolic rise is, is likely mm. i think we'll see one like it's just how humans work. It's just how markets work. I think we will see one at some point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's 2022, 2023, 2025, you know, I, th I think we'll see another one this decade is that would be my prediction just because um, at some point people are going to, we're going to forget 2017 and they're going to start to firm in, um in, into all cryptocurrencies, not just Monero, but Monero gets lifted up with the, with the tide. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it will happen. Um, I have no idea when it will happen because you know trying to predict human behavior is uh, you know is a somewhat folly. Yes, and yeah, yeah. I mean, the way I look at it, if, if Monero is sticking around and you know continue, continuing to grow in network effect and actual real world usage, at some point speculators are going to come in and be like, "This thing's here to stay." Uh, it's growing in usage. So let's think about if it's, you know, this many people are using it today, how many, many people will be using it in 10 years? And that's when the speculators rush in and start predicting, you know, super high prices. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, is on the cards, but, you know, trying to predict when is uh, a <laughs> very difficult game. So why do you, I mean, I'll ask you now, I was going to wait till you do some of the charts, but some more of the charts, but why do you think Monero has essentially been been lagging you know it's it you know we, we saw 
this latest bull run, you know, Bitcoin basically, you know, it's, it's last high was, was 20, 20 K right. And it's previous bull run. And now it went up to almost 70. I mean, we don't know if the bull runs over, but already, right. So like three X and Monero never, it just went back to its previous high and never even broke out above it. Um, you know, as we'll continue to talk about, you know, the metrics are all there. Usage is going up. Uh, you know, every, everything, it's like all, all systems go, right? Everything, everything looks good, yet the price just seems to be lagging. Why, why do you, any, any, you know, idea as to why that may be the case? I can think of a couple of arguments. Um, one would be that 2017 was an anomaly. And that due to, you know, extra, you know, unexpected events at the time, we had a much more ridiculous overvaluation than we would would get in the future. That would be the, the bearish case that um, 2017 was an outlier and we shouldn't necessarily expect price increases like that in the future. Um, the other argument, which would be sort of the bullish turn on that would be, Bitcoin always leads the market. Um, I think even at the beginning of this year, if you were to look at, say, Ethereum, Ethereum was down. Ethereum has moved like, I think it moved like 400% this year, whereas Bitcoin only moved 50. Um, you know, Bitcoin moved first, then the alts follow. That tends to be the cycle. And it looked like that was happening here. Like Monero had moved up over an order of magnitude, you know, on this, this amazing Bitcoin run. Mm -hmm. But it got killed because Bitcoin crashed too early. Um, so I think, you know, I think that would be my two ways of looking at it. Um, one is this was an extreme example we're not going to see again. Two is we need to wait for Bitcoin to run again and it needs to be a sustained Bitcoin rally for mm -hmm. people to feel confident speculating on something like Monero to really drive the price above this fair value band. Do you think it's any, you know, possible indication that the the bull run in general for crypto isn't over yet because Monero hasn't had its moment yet? I think I generally look at Bitcoin in terms of, you know, how the market cycle's going because it just it's it's the largest player. Um I would say that it would be strange for Bitcoin to only do a 3x from its previous all-time high. Uh, and then you know go into a, an eighty percent retracement. I think that would be very unusual. Uh, and again, a lot of the a lot of the alts, you know, uh, Monero hasn't take, really taken out its all time high. Um, yeah, I, I would suspect we haven't seen the end of this, and that we we thought we were entering twenty seventeen last year. That's what we all thought. I think maybe we were in a year like twenty sixteen where we're actually setting up for the real bull run. Um, mm -hmm. That, that's my personal bias um, on where we are right now. Um, yeah. Okay. So put in those, once again, put in those buy orders at, uh, yeah. at, at 112, grab yourself some yeah. arrow and then strap in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll head on to this chart, which can not, look not financial advice, across. you know, we'll, 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 we'll let, let, <laughs> let's say that, uh, you know, at least once. Sorry. Let's say none of this is financial advice, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the orange line here is, is the unit price of Monero. So we're not plotting the market cap anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's logarithmic in the y-axis. So each major tick is a 10x of the previous one. And the twist on this chart is that the x-axis here is represented as the number of days since the Genesis block in Monero so that was sometime in 2014. So we're currently sitting, you know, maybe uh, seven years after that. So about 20, 20, you know, 400 days or something after the Genesis block. And so mm -hmm. each point in here is labeled with the price and the number of days since the Genesis block. Okay. The twist is that the X axis is logarithmic. So the years get closer and closer and closer together. Um, and you end up with this funny trend in that it's it's pretty much perfectly linear here um, in terms of Monero price increasing with distance from the Genesis block. Um, this was a model developed by Harold Christopher Berger 
originally for Bitcoin, but mm -hmm. I've, I've essentially applied it to Monero and I think it works quite well. So the green line here is just a linear regression of all these points. So it's, you know, the computer figures out the straight line, which is closest to all the points, which captures the trend. And what we can do is we can just move this line up and down to try and get an idea of support and uh, resistance, basically. So this is our, you know, extreme high mania phase. And then I would think of this section very similar to our a buying band on the, um, the log regression. So we can see at the minute that Monero tried to do something like it did in 2017, where it breaks out of here, uses it as resistance, goes back up, but it, it just it just got killed halfway. Um, and we're just playing in this band here. And we have been basically since 2019. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this like uh, the rainbow chart that you see for... Yeah, so the rainbow chart is the is the logarithmic regression one. This is the rainbow chart. Oh, that's the rainbow just, chart. Okay. Um, you just plot, you just move this up and down, and that gives you more more rainbows, effectively. Got it. Um, yeah, this one it, it uses a similar technique. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that we've 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 logged the x-axis as well, mm -hmm. um, and so you get a straight line as as opposed to the curved one. Um, you can start to plot out some price points on here. Mm -hmm. So I plotted these out for 2025. I've, I've basically just picked that at random. Um, you, you know, you can find whichever date you want on the chart. Um, so by 2025, you know, what's interesting, is it does line up with the previous chart. Um, you know, the floor price will be roughly 330. We wouldn't expect to be staying below that too long. The, the sort of fair value average line about a thousand. And then, you know, if, if we were to peak in some sort of mania bubble, on the 1st of January, 2025, you could see that in the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. That's what this chart suggests in terms of, in terms of long-term growth. It's basically a, a, a time series model in that the, the longer Monero is running, the more value it accretes to itself. And it's doing this like logarithmically. And mm -hmm. I guess all of us have this, you know, we have this high time preference. We want it, you know, right now. Uh, but when you when you sit and you look back at the past six years, you can see that we've seen some crazy stuff. And you know, if the trend keeps following, we'll we'll do pretty well. So in, in twenty twenty five, um, the the green line that is is at a thousand. So people that are listening on podcast, um, the the low would be three thirty, and then the high would be seventeen thousand. Yeah, that that's you know if we were to peak at that very moment, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, realistically, I mean, I, you know, we could still stay in this just in this band forever and never not enter a parabolic run, and we'd we'd still be doing fine. So does it does it make sense for us to at some you know, can you make a prediction there as to when we might break out above that green line? You know, the amount of time that we're spending under it does it make sense at some point? On yeah, so, to, to come yeah. above it in the original article um it was noted that bitcoin spent about half as much time you know, it spent about half the time above the line and half the time below the line mm -hmm. that was an interesting observation um you can eyeball it here and you can see that you know if if that trend were to hold true for monero it's we don't know if it will um you know we, we, we could be in for some interesting times come 2023 2024 um but that that was the original observation in the the medium article which I, I recommend you read if you want to know a bit more about how this model works mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but again it's 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 dependent on human emotion which is you know famously <laughs> difficult to predict yes okay so that's interesting the half above half below and then if you're looking at this it looks like you know we're, we're kind of running out of time in, in terms of being below at some point we're going to have to go back above if you if that metric make you know if that makes sense where we're half above half below pretty much um yeah i think the the final thing i did with this shot just for fun i extended it all the way out to 2050 um, oh, wow. I, I would not expect this to be a reliable indicator of price but you know maybe i'll be looking back in 2050 and we'll <laughs> we'll uh we'll see what happens but you know if you if you just extend this linearly 
you get sort of a, a 20k floor price, a 50k average price, and a, a 1 million, um, you know, um, ceiling price. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that to the bank. Um, uh, Monero's only been around what six, seven years. Um, these data science models, they get to get better as you accrue more data. Um, if you were to look at the Bitcoin version of this chart, you'll see it's a lot, it's a lot nicer because we've got a lot more data. Uh, but I just thought that was a fun thing to do, just to, <laughs> just to think about the next sort of 30 years. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, what's a million dollars though, right? Uh, well, I guess, yeah. I think, I think this model assumes, you know, basically real, like today's money. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's one way this model could break in that um, there's, there's a really nice graph that I like. Um, if you look at the value of one ounce of gold versus the German... Um, the German Reichmark during uh, Weimar Germany, mm -hmm. uh, 1923 or so. It's interesting because it, it follows this logarithmic regression pattern. Like it, it, it looks the, similar to this chart, and then right at the end, it just it just goes to infinity as the the currency you know hyper deflates. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an interesting chart people should look at. If, um, yeah, so yeah, I, that, I take your point that a uh, million dollars might not be a million dollars, but yeah, well, I think once that's, once. Yeah essentially dies um <laughs> if it goes to zero then yeah a million dollars won't be uh, worth much yeah. um oh very cool so, yeah. the last version of this is just the the monero power law oscillator mm -hmm. again another invention of how christopher Berger. and essentially what you're doing here is you're taking the distance between this green line and the price and you do that for every every point on the graph and then you plot that so when it's under, it's a negative number. When it's over, it's a positive number. And you end up with something that looks a bit like this. So the theory is that it should stay close to, it should on average be at zero. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll run up to these points in the sort of, you know, extreme parabolic rallies. And the green section here represents the, the midway point. So it's below the average. Mm -hmm. which may or may not indicate a buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's just like a, it's just a transformation of the previous graph. It's a nice twist on it. Maybe a way to visualize whether things are crazy or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And obviously we're, we're below it right now, but like you said, it doesn't mean we can't go much further below it. Pretty much. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, again, it, it looked like we were going to have this beautiful sort of, you know, breakout over here. And then Bitcoin took a dump and it just sort of, yeah, it, it hasn't worked out well so far. We'll, we'll, yeah, it remains to be seen what the rest of the market cycle looks like. But it's why I like to, I like to focus more on um, things like the, the log regression, where I'm just thinking about where am I setting my buy orders? What is a, what is a non-bubble fair value of Monero, like a non-crazy time value? And mm -hmm. just think about that and not not stress about anything else yeah no that this is a great this is a great chart the monero yeah. total marker cap log regression puts things into perspective i like that mm. you had mentioned uh you know i guess monero is, is technically more more volatile than bitcoin mm. yeah right? yeah it has if you were to plot the the daily volatility so how much it moves in a day um, you can look at like the amount of how many times does Monero move more than 10% in a day? How many times does it move more than 20% in a day? You can compare that to Bitcoin. And from memory, I think the frequency is like 10x. So Bitcoin has had like, well, if you to look at a similar sort of time frame. So if you look at 2017 to now, mm -hmm. um, I think Bitcoin's had, I think two days where it moved more than 20% in 24 hours. Whereas Monero has had something like 20 um and you can do the same same sort of thing where you know how many days does it move more than 10 percent it's it's a similar sort of effect it's about 10x so basically monero can surprise you uh you know if you go to sleep for six months and you're not looking at the price you know you can be very you can be in a very different place um <laughs> <laughs> if uh if things get going um yeah that's that's it's one thing i look at with monero um, it tends to do either nothing or absolutely rocket. Those are, those are its two modes of being. Right. So it's interesting because, you know, anybody who's been holding Monero for the last, you know, 
it, fe- it feels almost less volatile, right? Mm. It feels like it's just like not, you know, there's that meme with the stick like pushing Monero. Like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my uh, uh, that was my <laughs> thumbnail. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So the yeah. So the 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 average day in Monero is is nothing's happening basically. It's quite boring, but it has these extreme. It has these outliers where things go absolutely crazy. Um, that that's the that's the profile of the volatility. And then, so is there something to look at there in terms of like when we might have the next crazy vol? Like we haven't had a crazy volatile day in, in X amount of days, so we're you know we're overdue. I haven't actually looked at that. That's probably a, a good idea. Um, all I did when I looked at it was I um, I plotted them out, and you know you get this graph that looks a bit like a normal distribution. Um, mm-hmm. I have a video on it. It's called like why Monero holders need patience. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the um you know you can look at it there uh but yeah that's probably a good idea actually to look at the the frequency between these different events yeah that'd be very cool yeah awesome man this is this is great uh thanks thanks for coming on thanks for doing this uh once again anybody who does not yet know chad go check out his youtube channel chad thackeray um and you know it's not just, not just Monero on there. He does this for a couple other cryptos. Is it just basically Bitcoin too, or you do a lot of different ones? Pretty much when I'm looking at like price analysis, like the stuff I've done here, I'm I'm mainly looking at Bitcoin and Monero, mainly because those are the only two projects I'm really interested in. Um, and then the rest of my stuff tends to be you know uh, like how. It's, Python like trading tutorials, how to you know make a trading bot on Binance or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's data science driven algo trading. That's my that's my tagline. What do you think? So Bitcoin is digital gold. Uh, Monero is digital cash. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there you know Monero can can be digital gold one day too? Like, I know I know there's a strong like community, lots of people believe that. I was scrolling through the uh, the Monero subreddit today. A lot of people um, do ascribe that quality to Monero. Mm-hmm. Um, the the thing that it's the auditability auditability that scares me. Um, like m- maybe it will happen, um, but my bet is that the the quality of auditability that Bitcoin has makes it a better method to store your life savings. Um, Whereas Monero would be something, you know, maybe you'd hold a month's salary or something in it and you'd use that for your day to day purchases. That's that's kind of how I see it. Like you haven't get you haven't gotten over that hump yet. I, <laughs> no. <laughs> do, do, don't you feel like o- over time though, that becomes even less significant, right? Because it's like if if Monero didn't break yet, chances are mm-hmm. it won't. I mean, Bitcoin had that same problem in the early days. We even had incidents where it had you know, it had issues where mm-hmm. uh, with uh, bugs in its its emission, um, do you think that heals with time? So as people gain trust in the fact that the cryptography is sound, that the implementation is sound, uh, you know that enough people have looked at it over the course of enough time, mm-hmm. um, do you think that that then dwindles with time? That that concern? Yeah, I mean it's it's always it's a small probability, right, that these things happen, uh, but I think. There's a there's an article on the getmonero.org website about I think Sarang wrote it. Um, it's about auditability. Um, the, the class of problems which affects Monero is undete- like undetected um, implementation flaws. Like mm-hmm. that that's the only way something could go wrong. Basically, the cryptography is pretty sound. Um, I don't I don't think that's going to be an issue. It's the it's the implementation that scares me, um, especially given the you know the nature of um, hard forking and things like that you know maybe you break consensus rules something goes wrong um yeah i mean so you know maybe this will change in five years time but like right now i i would not feel comfortable being you know putting everything i have into monero uh (laughs) whereas um you know if you i I probably would feel comfortable doing that with bitcoin Mm -hmm. um that's that's just the way i'm looking to at the minute um you know maybe something changes in the future that changes my mind but Right now, I view it as Bitcoin is long-term life savings. Monero is sort of, you know, how do I 
transact with the world day to day. Mm -hmm. That's that's currently how I view it. But this yeah, no, I, I, think, I, think that, I think that's very rational way of looking yeah. at it. Um, I do think over time, though, you know, because like you said, the cryptography. I don't think there's much much concern there. Bitcoin shares that same problem, so it's like. Mm -hmm. It's an issue in Monero. It's an issue in Bitcoin, right? Like the you know, if, if you're worried about it in Monero, you should be equally worried about it in, in Bitcoin. Yeah. Implementation, same thing. Bitcoin can have an issue, and it's it's had issues in the past. Uh, so can Monero. It's just you wouldn't necessarily notice it right away, but you would eventually notice it. So, um, I, I I just think that that's it's kind of just more it's it's very similar to Bitcoin. I don't I, ultimately mm. I don't really see a difference at the end of the day. They mm. both face the same fates. Um, they're both susceptible to a you know a, an issue with the underlying cryptography and an issue with the implementation. It's just you wouldn't see it as as quickly. And yeah, I just think over time. It becomes less of an issue as as people gain trust in the implementation. This is the way that's the way I look at it. But yeah, I'm obviously a Monero, a Monero Mac, <laughs> and I I, I, I want to believe too because I you know the fungibility is what you lose is what you're sacrificing mm. uh, with regards to having that additional feeling of security to be able to add up you know all the you know the Bitcoin transact you know the ledger with the ti82 uh you know you, you you can't do that you can't do that in in monero but what do you have you have you, you gain a lot you gain mm -hmm. fungibility which is you know a, a key ingredient to what digital gold should be mm -hmm. so it's very interesting because it's like you're saying you know people are saying you know Bitcoin is more digital gold, like because you have that extra trust or that extra, or there, there is less, potentially less trust involved. Um, but you're sacrificing fungibility, which I think is very much gold like too. So, yeah. you yeah, know, I mean, where, where, do you, where do you weigh that, right? Yeah, you can reclaim some of the fungibility using Monero, right? Uh, so you could, <laughs> you could use atomic swaps or something like that. Um, hopefully the infrastructure for that gets built out and then you know who knows maybe we're in some sort of situation where you have your bitcoin in a vault somewhere and the only way you interact with it is through um through monero or something like that mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that gives you the properties of both uh, yeah i think yeah there's some deep fundamental engineering trade-offs that are made between the two chains i think people are gonna argue about you know <laughs> is this more important is this more important We'll find out in time. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I said, either way, you're, you're trust you're trusting math and implementation for both. Um, yeah. The other thing too is like you know, so if security is so and so important, which obviously it is, but like you know, in, in Bitcoin, like, like like that's that's the number one priority. Uh, so much so that they're willing to sacrifice fungibility on the core protocol level. Then why is you know uh, the the tail you know the 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 unknown in terms of how Bitcoin will be secured in the future with mining mm. not an issue, right? If yeah. we're saying security is the you know the ultimate thing by by which we make our design decisions, so then. Isn't there a risk there with Bitcoin since it doesn't have the tail emission and, you know, there's an unknown with what will secure. Like, I know my gold, if I have a piece of gold here and sitting here on this desk, yeah. I know it will be sitting there for forever, right? And, you know, unless something happens in the on a quantum physics level and it just disappears <laughs> randomly, <laughs> like it's not, you know, it's going to be there. It's always going to be gold. Uh, with Bitcoin, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen 100 years, 200 years from now, whatever, you know, once we, uh, once the, the mind, you know, there's less incentive to mine, there's, there's unknowns there, right? There's predictions, right, of what's going to happen. But I feel like Monero is, has less of an unknown there because of its tail emission. So then how, do you, do you make those considerations too? In, in, so, in a way, yeah, I think, I think that that particular, 
unknown about Bitcoin is going to get resolved a lot sooner than 100 years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in, in 100 years, the, you know, the very last Satoshi is going to be mined. Um, but much sooner than that, you know, maybe 20 in the, in the 2030s, the mining reward is not going to be very high at all for Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it'll be 0.005 Bitcoin, something like that. Um, so we'll, we'll get to know that much sooner. Um, right. so isn't that, that, that risk is right around the corner then. Yeah. I mean, personally, uh, I think, I think transaction fees will be enough. Um, you can, you can run the calculations and I think to provide the same level of security, that you know the same amount of reward to miners as is currently provided. I think transactions transaction fees would need to rise to something like a hundred dollars per transaction. So yeah, are people willing to pay that? Um, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but it's it's not. I don't think it's going to be thousands of dollars for each Bitcoin transaction. Right, right. And even if they are, what what is the mining network look like at that point? Is it just mm-hmm. you know? five mega corporations around the world that are now mm. running bitcoin you know and is it like yeah, yeah sure they're, they're paying the the, the fees because they're they're okay with it or maybe it's even governments essentially you know s- subsidizing it or wh- whatever mm. is it then just a couple of big players that are okay with playing those fees and then is is bitcoin no longer as decentralized as it needs to be to maintain its censorship resistance. Yeah, I think so. Mining that's a that, that's that's one of these arguments. Um, you can kind of, I think you can see it both ways. In that, um, like, so with Bitcoin, you have these these larger companies. Um, they have these big ASIC farms, lots of capital invested in them. A lot of them are public now. Um, so you can see that as a negative, you can say, look, uh, you know, these 10 people on X percentage of the hashing power, this is bad. Um, in that the government or some other entity could co-opt the, uh, the miners. You can view it the other way around in that these corporate interests can co-opt the government um, and they can, they can, you know, lobby for better uh, legislation, better tax treatment of Bitcoin, things like that. Um, that would be that would be the other view. Um, I think like Michael Saylor is very um, he's a very strong proponent of that view that it's actually good for Bitcoin because it, it gives Bitcoin you know strong friends who can go and uh, go and lobby different governments around the world and protect it. Whereas with Monero, there's not there's not that kind of you know large you know large in, um, concentration of power that can go and knock on a government's door and sort of push them in the right direction, you know, say, look, we're bringing jobs to our state or whatever. So that's, that would, that would be the other argument, but I can, I can see what you mean. Yeah. I think that argument's a str- I think that argument, mm. um, shows, a. you know, I, I don't think Michael Saylor really mm. believes that. I, I don't know what he really, but I, I, but I have to imagine he doesn't really believe that. Or if he does, I think it shows that he doesn't really understand the cypherpunk, mm. like kind of crypto anarchist purpose of crypto, which is, that it's to ex- be a technology that's self-propelling and can exist on its own without, you know, getting the okay from any government, right? So the idea is that you don't need to rely on uh, corporations or governments to to allow it to exist. It just exists and is completely unstoppable and, and can't, you know, uh, be slowed down. And then so that's where I think things like uh, you know, a more decentralized network, organic network, like, like, you know, Monero, where it's aiming to be essentially like a one CPU, one vote type of thing as, as many computer CPUs as possible, mining it where anybody can, can opt in. Um, I think that's the, the goal, I think, as opposed to hoping that, uh, the game theory comes into place and, people you know we re- then rely on governments wanting it to exist is the way i look at it yeah i think you know we have we have bitcoin we have monero we have them both um uh, we're running these simultaneous experiments maybe they both work maybe one of them doesn't work i think it's, i think it's good we have both of them uh and we'll we'll just see that that's that's my uh, <laughs> that's my look at it i try and look at you know what do these people think what do these people think you know uh, yeah and that, see what happens. You're doing a great job, man. Really, really <laughs> appreciate everything you, you know you're doing. I, I like your videos. Um, 
Any chance you'll be down in Miami? I know we, we talked about this briefly yesterday before we jumped on. Yeah, I'm 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 strongly considering going down to Miami. Um, I'll see if I can get some yeah get some flights booked, and if there's any hotels left in Miami uh, <laughs> from all the Bitcoiners running down there. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a good chance I'll be at uh, Bitcoin 2022, and if I'm there, might as well pop down to Monero Topia. That's that's why we put it at the same time. Man. <laughs> you get that might as well effect, you know? Yeah. Yeah, would love would love to have you, man. Um, that'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, once again, I meant, you know, just where people can find you. Why don't you go ahead and mention that? Yeah. So my main sort of social media is my YouTube channel. You can find that at just, if you just Google Chad Thackeray. Um, and then if you want to find a bit more about me, you can look at my website, which is just chadthackeray.com. If you want to send me an email or something, I have a contact form on there. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.